when you come to this school, this is just this group of women. They just love you from the time you get here till the time you leave, and they just keep loving you through your as long as you you know you're alive. My parents, they uh, always told me I wasn't good enough. Uh, it was always my fault when something happened. My life was was not much. I had no direction. I had no dreams. And I guess that's it, my dream had died. I'm a child of Appalachia. I grew up in the mountains of western North Carolina in a small town of Banner Elk, population about 200. But I had a wonderful childhood growing up there and being able to walk in the mountains and swim in the lake was a wonderful childhood experience. But I also knew that girls were treated differently than boys. They were not allowed to do all the things that boys were allowed to do and I always thought that was very unfair. And as I got older and started thinking about what I would do with my life, I also learned that people expected girls to be either a teacher or a secretary or a nurse. We were never told we could be anything beyond that. We were also told you need to get an education in case your marriage fails, you'll have something to fall back on. It was expected that we would all get married and have children and stay home with them. And yet the women of the mountains have always been strong and progressive, I think. Uh, I remember my own grandmother who lived into her 90s who was very opinionated and uh, took over after her uh, husband died and helped run the farm and that sort of thing. And I think the women of the mountains have always had this ability to, uh, to do things, uh, certainly take care of the family, but quite often they didn't have the opportunity of, of taking care of themselves very well. So in 1984, when um, John was invited to be president of Berea College, we moved to Berea, Kentucky. Very interesting time for us, but I also knew that I wanted to do something else uh, besides being the president's spouse, which was fun and I enjoyed that, but I also felt like that I needed to, to do something that would be of significance. Sometime around there in 1986, um, I had a, a friend up in the mountains who, um, who's, who's, who was struggling with her life. I received a phone call from our friend Gurney Norman. Gurney is a well-known Kentucky writer and has been a good friend for a long time. He was teaching creative writing at the University of Kentucky. And so just on impulse one day, um, I picked up the phone and called Jane in Berea. And, uh, and I think I said, Jane, what are we going to do? And he called because he had a friend he had uh, been talking with who had just gotten a very unexpected divorce. She was a middle-aged woman, um, divorced with children and had been out of the workforce, um, actually hardly ever in it. She had very little work experience, unfinished education, and, and she was trying to, um, um, to uh, you know, make progress with her life, and I was aware of her struggle. And she was left with children to raise no income. She had never worked didn't feel like she had an education or training to do anything and she didn't know what she was going to do with her life. So she was asking Gurney to help her and he said that her self-esteem was so low because of all the things that had happened. So he called to ask if we were doing anything at Berea College that would be of help to her. Did we have any programs? And Berea has always been known for outreach program and helping other people, but we didn't have a program for Appalachian women like Gurney's friend. And Jane went to John and asked about it and said, no, there's really nothing, but couldn't you create one? Well, I'm sure it scared Jane to death to think that, you know, out of the blue she's supposed to create something, but with that strong southern 
attitude, she's like, well, surely we can figure this out. Jane was so good at um, mobilizing other people to, um, to support this effort. Um, so I gathered together about 15 people from around campus in the living room of the President's home, and I said, here's what we need to do. We need to design a program. We need to think how long it would be. We need to think about the cost. Who is the program for? What do we want to accomplish? What will our mission be? And we sat there brainstorming, and really that was the beginning of the New Opportunity School because we haven't made a whole lot of changes since that afternoon. The Opportunity, I love the name. I think the name is just wonderful. The New Opportunity School for Women. Opening doors, walking through them, learning about fear, learning how to manage, learning how to dream. And I know when my husband died, I just felt like a child that someone had sat down in, you know, just out in the world to fend for itself. I had previously uh, lost a son in a car accident and it devastated me. Um, I was just going through life, just through the motions and not really doing anything with my life. I, my self-esteem was so low uh, and felt of no worth and I was so codependent on men that I, I probably wouldn't be alive. Most of the women that come here are women that have had really tough times. Their life has been the pit, so to speak, especially if you get a chance to talk to some of them. And they've already been through the valley. So now somebody's there giving them a hand up out of the valley so they can get to the mountaintop. I can suck the air out of the room talking about the women. The women are the reason we do this. They are bright, they are smart, beautiful, inside and out, and they don't know it. And we are here to help the women find that inner spark again, that hope. If you have ever seen a woman with no hope in her eyes, and then three weeks later, 21 days, to see that change in a woman, and everyone who has gone through a graduation knows that. That's why I do it. The women are the reason. I look at George Ann Lakes, who was a graduate, to know where she was 20 years ago, the impact the program has had on her and her family. Uh, I had never felt like I had a voice, never had education, and I was always, in some ways, felt like a second-class citizen. And when I grew up in the mountains, the men were thought of very highly, but women were second. And. Uh, when I came to Jane's program, the first thing I learned was that I had a voice to be proud of my Appalachian heritage, which I was ashamed of for many years, uh, and that uh, I had a lot to offer, even at an older age. We raised our kids. Jerry worked all the time. I was a stay-at-home mom. We didn't have electric. I cooked on the wood stove. I didn't have running water. You know, I wouldn't trade it, honestly. But you know. And then when we did get all that stuff, you know, and I used to do all the phone calling for everybody in the family and this and this and that. I, like I said, I, I had the ability, I didn't have the education. You know, you would go to get a public job, people look at you like, really? <laughs> These women are so smart, but nobody's ever really told them that. They've never been encouraged to go on to school or to, to make something of themselves. And they, most of them know that there's more in life for them, but they don't know what to do about that. I was told I was stupid. I had no sense. Uh, I never had anyone but except my grandmother when she was elderly to tell me that I was worth something. But when people tell you you ain't worth nothing and you're dumb and you cause bad luck, you believe that. I didn't have anywhere else to go. I mean, I didn't have anything else to lose at that point. Um, I was doing a drug court program. They allowed me to come down um, because I wasn't finished yet. I still had jail time hanging over my head and it was like, I can step out onto this new arena and try something different or I can go back home and, and just stay stuck in what I was doing. 
there's just all these women that have just been, they've just stayed at home and they don't know how to function in the outside world. And even though my husband was abusive, I, I just thought I was gonna die after he, after he died because I did not know how to take care of myself. When I lost my kids, it like my world was taken from me. I had nothing to live for. Um, I had several suicide attempts, but uh, God wasn't ready for me yet. My um, daughter taught me into, talked me into going to uh, the New Opportunity School and to put an application in. And um, I got accepted. And that's where the rest of my life began. Before I came here, Schooling was not my main concern. You know, the kids had grown and I was like, I was lost. And I know this sounds selfish, but I knew I was smarter than that. And Jane and this um, program helped me find that. Find the opening, you know. So all I needed was one door to open and you would be amazed at the doors that have opened. <sighs> Sorry. Women have told us how hard it is for them to leave home. And their children are saying, don't go, mommy. And husbands are saying, you're not going to go. I don't want you to go. And so they're not getting a lot of encouragement to better themselves. But they come anyway. And then when they arrive, sometimes they're so scared they don't even want to get out of the car. There seems to be a lot of, of concern over whether they get to come or not. One woman uh, was from outside Moorhead somewhere, and she had said to her husband, I need to go and I need you to take care of the children for three weeks. And he said, I don't want you to go, you can't go. And she, something in her was saying, i am got to go, I've got to do this for myself. And so she said she stopped her car on the side of the road and got out and walked up and down and up and down the road saying, I'm going, I'm not going, I'm going, I'm not going, as she was trying to weigh all the sides to it. And finally she said, I am going. You know, they're nervous, they don't know what to expect. Although we talk to them for months before they even get here, and we tell them that there's nothing to be worried about, you know, and we're really actually as nervous as they are because we're not, we don't know what to expect either. They're scared. They're scared to, to leave where their comfort level is and they don't think they can. We teach them that you can. One of the good phrases is, don't say I can't, because there, there are very few things that we can't do. And it was so scary to think that I'd be away from home with strangers for, you know, three weeks. It, it was just something I'd never done. I mean, I could barely go to my mailbox. I could barely look out my window. I drove down um, from Pike County all by myself, and I sat in the parking lot out at the, at the motel where we, we stayed for our session, and it took me about 20 minutes to get out of the car. <laughs> and walk in and I could see all the other women walking up and and um, the ladies on staff were you know welcoming them in and, and they were all smiling and happy and I was really scared I just I didn't know if it was where I needed to be. Nervous when I got the call decided not to come at least twice <laughs> then the day came and uh, I didn't think I was good enough to come over here. My mother had told me before she died, she said, I want you to go on and pursue your career. What you want to do, you do. Because she said, my life's over and I'm ready to go. And I know that that was my, my time. It was for me to, it was time for me to fly. The first Sunday night that the women come to the school, we get together and talk and ask, I ask them how they hear about the school, what do they want to get out of the school, a little bit of their history. That is the heaviest, deepest, most searing night of the whole three weeks to me. But once they get here, after that very first night, the second day, it's just like they've known each other forever. And I have seen them go from questioning, why am I here? 
to um, going to their internships and saying, I can't do it, I'm not smart enough, this is beyond my capability, to that blossoming through the first week, they start to get it. And you see it, they come back. We talk every week about their internships, pretty much every day. And into that second week where she comes back and a woman might say, I had a great day today, it was fantastic. I actually learned how to use a computer. Or Janie Polk told me this, and it made sense because today at work, this happened. They start making that connection. And by the third week, they are interacting among, among themselves, more so than with the staff. And to me, that's a huge success because they have learned to fly on their own. They don't need us holding their hand. There are many things that we help them think about, and not only what their skills might be and what jobs are available, but thinking about their own culture and helping them understand what an important culture it is in the region that we live in. So they learn about Appalachian literature and writers that have written about women like themselves. They learn to write creatively and express their thoughts and that helps them in building their self-esteem as well. We take them places like to Frankfurt, to the state capitol, to the governor's mansion. They meet people. They start broadening their lives, they're interested in what they're interested in, just the scope of their knowledge of so many things that they did not have before. And they love it. They're like sponges. They, they really want to learn. I got to do things I hadn't, hadn't done before and see it in a different light. I seen, I really appreciated what I had missed. I didn't know that you know, we went to the governor's mansion, we went to, um, they took us out to dinner, they treated us like queens. Miss Janie Polk's class, I, I really enjoyed that. You know, she really uh, made me feel that I can do whatever I wanted to do. And one of the books that we had to read was Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Um, I love that book. I mean, I read that book over and over. And that book is absolutely eye-opening and just wonderful. Now, whoever had a course anywhere on fear, on how to manage fear, and yet fear is something that every single person has. I've been afraid to do a lot of things in life. Uh, and because of my fear, I didn't do really what I wanted to do. I was like a sponge just taking it all in. Uh, I, realized that even at my age, um, at the time I was, I had turned 50, and they helped me to realize that, um, it, you know, it doesn't matter what your age is, uh, your life is not over. And then after they start having all their classes, and they just start growing, and they bloom, and then by the time graduation rolls around, you see a big difference. They really begin to open up in those three weeks, which they're just like a, a little bud when they come in, and then they're like a big blossom when they leave. I always tell them they're the strongest women I've ever met because I'm not sure at the age of 35 if I could have done that myself. But I see them come scared and intimidated and holding their heads down and not looking you in the eye. And graduation day, I watch them walk up to the podium. I watch them look out at the crowd and speak. Some of them are very, very afraid to speak, but they speak. And they say things like, I was told for years that I couldn't. And I come to this program and in three weeks, I know I can and I want to. We did feel the fear, <laughs> and we did it anyway. <laughs> and we have walked on many courageous paths, ones that we didn't always realize were that courageous until we got past them. <laughs> I never knew women like this before. I've never known a school like this where you give and you give and you give, and it all started with Shirley Thompson. I never dreamed. You could change my life like this. She wasn't where she had been. She wasn't where she was going. But she was on her way. <laughs> Christina L. Johns.
the end of the three weeks, I'm looking at different people. I wish that all the people in that audience could have seen the women on the first day that they came and see the transformation, see how they have blossomed and changed. It is wonderful to watch. We provide a makeover, we provide clothing if they need it, and I can remember one little boy looked up at his mother and on the graduation day and saying, Mom, is that really you? And we, we love it when, when they are so changed. And they're changed not only in appearance, but what's on the inside as well. It was a complete um, life-changing experience. I know it's probably been said a lot, but um, somebody else believed in me. And so that feeling when I stood up at the graduation and gave my speech was I was a different woman, I was a different person, and um, I wasn't afraid anymore. So we, I opened up a car lot <laughs> in Jackson County, in the San Gap area. I'm the only car lot there. There's one in McKee, a couple in McKee, but I'm the only one in San Gap. And my name is on the business. <laughs> I do all the paperwork. And if it hadn't been for this, there's no way I would have felt comfortable. Right now, I'm attending a college at, uh, at Big Sandy in Prestonsburg. Um, I will be um, graduating in May with my associate's degree, and I will, I'm planning on uh, uh, attending Moorhead to receive my bachelor's degree there. And um, things are starting to move forward in my life. I went back to college. I um, am majoring in accounting. I will get my associate's degree in uh, summer of 2012. I'm on the Honor Society. I am just, I really, I came back to life. The New Opportunity School is a turning point in my life. It's like the most pivotal point. It really is like a cornerstone for me. If it hadn't been for the New Opportunity School, I, I have no idea where I would be now. You know, I feel like if I hadn't have gone to college, I probably would have been maybe living off of welfare, maybe having food stamps. My life certainly would not have been as rich as it, as it is now. It transformed me to something beyond what I could ever imagine. I've since gone to school, graduated, got my master's in psychology, got my license. It just opened a whole new world for me because I knew once I left New Opportunity School for Women, I was gonna go back to Lexington and start college. I am um, working in the clothing closet as a clothing closet coordinator, and I am also working at Walmart. I sell jewelry to people, and I also pierce people's ears. And it just, it just gives me satisfaction to um, help people. My biggest dream is, is I want to, when I get a job, I want to be a contributor to the New Opportunity School because of the amount of help that they've had, that it's helped me. Arson investigators in Berea are looking into a fire that destroyed the New Opportunity School for Women overnight. What are we gonna do? You know, I knew it wasn't the end of the school. I remember the shock. It was, I'm sure, what everybody was thinking. What? What? We have a tape. We think we know who did it, but we can't find that person. Sometimes we get in a comfort zone and we stay there because it feels good and we don't have to worry about anything. But the fire took that away from it, from the New Opportunity School. I mean, it's just a building. It, I mean, I knew we would go on, but you know, I was, I thought of all the memories that was gone. You know, we had all the pictures on the wall. It, it was discouraging, you know, it seems like for about a day. But quickly, this uh, spirit of determination um, of the people who actually operate the school, but this wide network of people who care about it and support it, rallied. I knew that this would not be the end of the New Opportunity School for Women. And I think it just reignited a sense in all of us, again, no pun intended, 
but we really need to stay committed on our mission and it reinforced that we, we are on the right path and it's just propelled us forward a little bit quicker than we had planned to and to me that's still a good thing. Challenges aside, it's still a good thing because we have, I think it's 685 women, 85 graduates to date, close to 700. I would like 700 more in the next 25 years, if not more, because of our new site that's coming. So now we're headed into the second 25 years of uh, effort with the New Opportunity School for Women. Um, and in spite of the fire. We know we'll expand in, in 2013. There's even a possibility of another expansion in 2014. Starting the program at Lee's McRae was really exciting. We weren't sure we could do it and it was a huge success. That first session was in 2005. This program is so unique that sometimes it takes a long time for somebody else to hear about us. Oprah was a perfect example. She, she obviously had never heard anything about Berea, Kentucky and the New Opportunity School, but when she did, she was like, holy cow, there's something that I can do to help. As people are learning about the program, people who work with Appalachia know that our program is working. We have a track record now of 25 years of success, and we believe that we can help even more women in the years to come. Now we're looking toward another uh, expansion program, probably in Virginia. So we're going to have even more women that we help in the future. And we'll continue to help, I believe, because there are always women there that want to better themselves. I think that's wonderful to say that we've, we've helped almost 700 women to go out and do better in their life. And, and it is a trickle-down effect. It helps their children, too. We now have children going to college that probably would not have gone but their mothers have come home strong and realize the value of education, so they're instilling that in their children. And we know of case after case where the women have encouraged their children to stay in school and go on to college. My youngest daughter, she's 14, freshman in high school. I got paperwork the other day from EKU wanting her to start a program during the summer. So, and they're like, if you can do it, I can do it. I've even talked to a lot of older women about going back to college. And I had a lady the other day to tell me that I had really inspired her. It impacts all the family. It doesn't just impact us. You know, it impacts our families, you know, our, our children, you know, as well as our siblings. I'm so thankful that uh, Jane started it, that she continued it. And I know she's had many uh, problems during the, during the time that she's, you know, been in it for 25 years. I know that she felt like so many times of quitting. It's a special uh, celebratory moment, I think, for an organization um, that had a dream, um, was able to put that dream into into a format that create that you could act upon. Um, and succeed, I think, for 25 years is, is not a small task. The future of this school is our graduates. Yes, we need donors. Yes, we need all of the foundations. But really, the future is the women. If we don't have the women, we do not have the new opportunity school. I have a voice today that I never had before. And I have a master's degree in social work, which gave me even more confidence. Still learning. Hope I never quit. I have dreams now, I have hopes, I have, you know, desires, I think about my future as opposed to, you know, when is all this going to end. You're going to ha have a different life because there's, there's so much out there and they're going to tell you here that you, there's nothing that you can't do. You can do what you want to do if you set your mind to it. These 25 years of the New Opportunity School have been just a blessing to so many people, myself included. When I think of all the women that I have met, the courage they've exhibited, the successes they've made of their lives, it is truly amazing. And I want to see that continue the next 25 years and beyond. I love the New Opportunity School for Women. It helps so many women, and I know they can help so many more women. Ms. Janie Stevenson, she's an awesome woman. I'm so thankful for her that she started this program. 
but I just want to tell her thank you that she kept it going because they are more people, they are more women out there that needs help.